All right, it's 12.03. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. And we have, may have a few people joining um, as we go, but I wanted to be respectful of everyone's time. So welcome. Um, I'm Lisa Casper. I am the program manager for Husky Innovate. And today's event is part of our lineup for Innovation Week. We are very pleased to be able to host our next presenter, David Schall. Uh, he graduated from tech in 2015 with a degree in computer engineering and computer science. And David is one of the founding team members of, a popular, of the popular platform Handshake. Launched in Michigan Tech, Handshake is the largest early network career, uh, uh, career network in the United States. Hold on, I'm not sure folks are hearing that. Okay. Um, He's a, he, Handshake is the largest early career network in the United States, connecting over 1,300 universities, 600,000 employers, and over 10 million students. Handshake was designed to democratize access to opportunity. And today, Handshake is valued at over $3.5 billion and operates in the United States and the United Kingdom. In this talk, David will share stories and, and learnings from scaling the startup from five to 500 people and the journey from Houghton to Silicon Valley and then London. Take it away, David. Perfect. Thanks, Lisa. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me and for taking the time out of your day to, to join the, the conversation today. Um, see some familiar names on the, the call today. So, um, should be hopefully fun. I'm gonna see, Lisa, if it's okay, I'll take over the screen sharing here sure. yeah. and we can jump in. So um, I, if you know me, you know that I like to keep these types of things relatively uh, informal. Um, so as I was kind of thinking through like, what are some of the things that might be worthwhile talking about today? I was trying to kind of do two things. One, uh, reflect back on my time at Michigan Tech and some of the things that I wish that I would have known or that somebody would have helped kind of formalize for me, um, but also then kind of look forward and over the past kind of seven, eight year journey that we've been on growing and building Handshake, um, what are some of the things that we've learned that might be helpful if you're thinking about starting your own company or you're thinking about maybe even just going to work for a startup, um, some of those life lessons that, uh, that we've learned in many cases the hard way. Um, so just a uh, kind of a little bit more of, a, of an introduction and, and background. Um, so this is kind of the, the journey that I took to, to Michigan Tech I'll share just kind of a, a couple of fun antidotes here that actually tie into some of the, the learnings that I had. Um, one of the things I'll talk about is the role of luck. And I'm a, a big believer that everyone gets a, a little bit of luck in life, but it's just how you uh, use it and how well you are equipped to actually take advantage of it that dictates things. Uh, and my arrival at Michigan Tech was actually pretty much luck. Uh, when I was graduating high school, I was considering three universities uh, at the time. Uh, one of them I decided was just way too expensive. The other one didn't feel like a good fit from an academic and culture perspective. And so despite absolutely hating winter uh, at the time, I decided that I was going to Michigan Tech, which was my in-state option. And uh, to be honest, somewhat begrudgingly arrived at the q and uh, that uh, kind of August day. And I think it probably took me 48 hours to absolutely fall in love with it. I think for all of us that have been there and spent time in the q and it is one of the most beautiful places on earth. Uh, and just fell in love with Michigan Tech's culture, the experience. Uh, I like to tell people I had a pretty relaxed freshman year, really um, kind of just spent that time exploring, learning what college was all about um, and really getting into some Call of Duty. And it wasn't until I think K-Day on my sophomore year that I um, was talked into going to this big festival. And uh, I'll never forget, I kind of walked up to this booth and there was this just incredibly gregarious guy, his name was Trevor Gibson. Um, and I don't think that he knows this. He graduated pretty quickly after uh, I joined the organization, but probably changed the trajectory of my time at Michigan Tech uh, in a, a way that um, I don't even you know, fully appreciate myself. But uh, you know, he started talking about all the great reasons to join this organization called Love Board. Um, and the one that really got me was that the, uh, you know, as a part of Mub Board, the Mub Dining team actually brought in a high quality catered dinner. And I was like, ooh, like that sounds different than dining hall food, like worth, worth trying to check it out for, uh, for at, least, at least one meeting. 
And I uh, was sitting in that meeting and they were talking about how do we get more people to show up? And it was, you know, thinking about social media and all these different ways that we could be engaging students and got hooked. And that kicked off uh, a stream of getting involved in just about everything that I possibly could. Um, you know, Mub Board, USG, Pavlos Honors College, I was in the Global Institute, like enterprise, uh, you know, pretty much everything on campus was just looking for opportunities to get plugged in and engaged. Um, and there was a lot of learnings from that. I see uh, Jesse Stapleton's on the, the call, uh, one of my uh, mentors when I was at Michigan Tech and uh, also put up with a lot of my antics. And, uh, and we'll talk about that later. Um, but we'll talk about my uh, the kind of attempted impeachment. And so there's a story there that we'll share and some learnings. My junior year, uh, um, or kind of actually technically my, my fourth year at Michigan Tech, I uh, got referred by my friend Garrett to Silicon Valley and had my first taste of what it was like out there. And um, it was after that internship that Garrett Lord, who is the CEO and one of the co-founders of Handshake, kind of sat down on a bench with me. Uh, in Palo Alto and said, you, you, now that you've kind of have this brand on your resume, you can probably go work for any of these technology companies that you want. Uh, or you could come work with me and we'll build a company that levels the playing field. Uh, it was incredibly challenging for a lot of us to break into Silicon Valley because of the inequalities that existed in the university recruitment landscape. Um, and so the opportunity to try and do something about that was really appealing. And so I joined Handshake uh, thereafter as a right, you know, basically that day. Uh, as the, the kind of first official full-time employee after the, the three founders. If you're not familiar with Handshake, we have a pretty simple mission, um, which is to democratize opportunity. We've kind of recently expanded that out to say our, our real mission is to help everyone find a great job and build a meaningful career, whether you're starting, restarting, or jumpstarting that, uh, that career. Um, big part of that is you know, leveling the playing field. We really believe that you shouldn't have to have experience or luck or you know, existing social capital in order to start to, to really um, build a career that's meaningful for you. We started um, with pretty humble beginnings. And we, uh, you know, we're, this is actually the house in Houghton that we, uh, we worked out of um, for the first probably six to, to eight months. Uh, in the, the kind of living room, it was an absolute mess. And, uh, but that's where Handshake really got started, uh, right off South Street there. About six months afterwards, we were able to raise a little bit of funding and relocate to Palo Alto. Uh, if any of you have seen Silicon Valley, the, the HBO show, uh, that actually came out while we were living in this house um, in Palo Alto, uh, ironically at the co-founder of LinkedIn's house, which will become um, increasingly funny as this handshake takes on LinkedIn. And so we rented this house room. That was where we lived, we worked. That's where kind of handshake was based for about a year. And um, kind of finishing that thought, if you've seen HBO Silicon Valley, that came out while we were living there. We kind of got together and watched it. And I think we're all braced for that to be a bit of a mockery of everything that we were working towards. Uh, and I will tell you right now that it is far more accurate than, uh, than anybody might imagine. It is uh, the ups and downs and just crazy things that happen are very on, on point. They did their research for that show. So if you want a little glimpse into what it was like in the house, that's uh, a good place to start. Um, after we continued to go, kind of grow up there, we moved into an office in San Francisco. Um, and uh, today we have uh, about, I think something like 22,000 square feet of office space in downtown San Francisco in the financial district. We have offices in Denver, uh, just opened up one in New York, Chicago. Uh, they haven't begun to use as much. We've now really kind of adopted this kind of remote and hybrid work way of working, um, which has been uh, interesting and, and really neat. Um, I personally have been leading our international expansion efforts for the past three years in San, or excuse me, in, uh, in London, obviously did not update that title, and um, have really uh, just been um, incredibly fortunate and, and really, you know, it's been a lot of fun to, to build that. I just moved back to the US, I'm actually here in uh, Southern Michigan, wasn't able to make it up for this talk in person, but um, am now kind of leading a, a new initiative for Handshake as well back in the, the US. But uh, before leaving, had grown the UK operation to 20 universities, including institutions like Cambridge, um, our first premium employers, and grew the team there from nothing to uh, about 20 people. So um, it's a little bit about me. Let's jump into hopefully what you're all here for, which is just kind of some um, life lessons and, and tips if you're thinking about this journey. Uh, the first part, like I said, is going to be kind of what I, I, knew, I wish I knew when I was at Michigan Tech. Some of this stuff, uh, most of it, I, I found out the hard way. 
Um, and one of the things uh, that I had the opportunity to do at Michigan Tech in my final year was actually TA a class with the Pavlis Honors College. Uh, it wasn't called the Honors College then, it's just the Pavlis Institute of Global Instit or Technological Leadership. So you can see why name brand maybe was a uh, rebrand was needed. Um, but that was one of my favorite experiences. And at that uh, time, I was trying to think about how do I articulate just this really unique opportunity that these students had. Most of the people in the class were first years, second years. They were just starting this journey that is their time at university. Um, and I, I was really kind of wrestling to try and describe and come up with a metaphor to help kind of empower them to take risks and learn. And one day it just clicked. I thought back to the time that I had growing up. This is actually a picture of me. I'm not really sure how old I am here, maybe eight or nine. Um, and we, uh, my sister and I would always spend time building sandcastles. Anytime we'd go to the water, which was quite frequently, it's something my family loved to do. We would build sandcastles um, and we'd wait. We'd build these kind of as close to the water as we could. And we'd wait to see how do the waves interact with them. Uh, inevitably, they would kind of get destroyed, but we didn't get demoralized by that. We were encouraged by what we had learned. How do we build this better? Different moat technology is actually going to provide more protection. Um, it was a really low risk way to, to learn. And actually the learning itself was really fun. And that's when it started to, to dawn on me that that's a lot of what university is like. Um, I, I think like a lot of the, the kind of stories we'll tell here, like it was, it was challenging, right? To, to go through some of these things that we learned some hard lessons, but at the end of the day, it's a pretty low risk place to get involved, to try new things, to push yourself, but to also step back and say, this is temporary, right? The decisions and things that happen here aren't going to, necessarily impact my entire life if they don't go well. And so why not try things that I wouldn't otherwise do? Um, it really, through that lens, can lower the stakes and empower you to learn much faster than you would otherwise. And when I talk about learning, as you'll see as we go through this, um, you know, I'm not necessarily talking about what you're learning in your coursework or your classes. It's all the things that sit around that that actually make a big difference when you start to enter in the career or you think about starting your own business. Um, so again, the, the kind of sandbox metaphor, I think, is such a good one for the university space because it is your time. These kind of four or five years while you're there to iterate, to experiment, to try new things, to fail, and to have you know, that um, you know, kind of safety net of being at the institution, being at the university, and being able to kind of move on. And when you enter the world of work or you kind of restart or you change careers, you have that opportunity to take those learnings with you and to move faster. So for me, I very much embraced this. Um, and I thought it'd be helpful maybe to bring that to life. I mentioned a little bit about my board earlier. This is a big part of my time at Michigan Tech. Uh, still has a, a close place in my heart um, because this is where I learned a lot of my lessons on leadership, on people, on these different dynamics. Uh, after that first meeting, I, like I said, I was hooked. I got involved as the social media chair and um, then ran for president the next year. So became president of the organization and had really inherited it at a time when it was going through quite a bit of crisis. The, um, if you like, kind of read back through the, the history of the organization, it had frequently been one of the largest organizations on campus, organizing some of the biggest events, really a, a centerpiece of the student experience. Um, but when I joined, there was about 12 members and the, I think the cutoff for USG funding was 10. So we were flirting with actually becoming um, you know, shut down. And this was an organization that I think had been in operation for 50 to 100 years at the like that at Michigan Tech. And so we knew that change was needed. We're going to have to start to rethink this. We're going to have to go on a recruitment drive. We really needed to kind of reinvigorate the organization. And so within the first couple of days of my presidency, that's what I did. Start shaking things up, change things, start pushing the status quo, meeting with people that I, in hindsight, probably had no business meeting with being like, hey, like, what if we renovated the entire basement or like blew up the bowling alley or we had a, a concert on a barge? really starting to you know, push the, the thinking and the status quo. But what I wasn't doing is trying to bring others along. Uh, I wasn't sitting down with different members of the organization. I wasn't asking how they thought about this. I wasn't kind of getting buy-in. And about probably a month or two into my, my presidency on the organization, uh, my treasurer uh, in the open session put a vote forward to have me impeached. And uh, if you've never gone through that, there's nothing that stings quite as badly as a group of people literally taking a vote as a commentary on your leadership and how bad they think it has been, so much so that they want to remove you from the organization. 
but that's what happened. It was, uh, I, I'm kind of very happy and, and fortunate that uh, the recruitment drive, a lot of the people that I brought on stood by me. Um, and that, that, you know, and so I was able to, to stay on in leadership. I think literally the next meeting, everybody, uh, our size had been cut in half and we had to, to start over. And so just to kind of bring that connection back to the, the sandbox metaphor, right? This, this really hurt, like not to downplay, like this is very real emotions, right? This was a very challenging time for me to try and figure this out. But I'll tell you what, I learned my lesson. Like you have to bring people along and you can push the status quo, but you've got to be able to kind of have those conversations to, to do it in a way um, that does and kind of evolve people's thinking. Uh, otherwise you're just never going to find success. And so those lessons are things that I use every single day at Handshake uh, when we think about growing, changing the way that universities, employers, and even students think about navigating their career. Uh, you can't just dictate what that's going to be like. You have to actually have to bring people along. And that's one of those experiences you kind of really live through this. One of the other things that I kind of, um, you know, it took, took me a little while, but it's, it's just continued to pay dividends is this idea that learning is an investment with like a guaranteed upside. Um, you know, there's so much in the news these days about like crypto investing and you know, obviously the stock market's been all over the place and um, you know, there's, there's lots of different things that, that you can kind of invest in, but I'm a big believer that learning is the, the best. Um, I, I have, uh, you know, maybe undiagnosed, but definitely have like ADD, ADHD, like my brain does not learn best by sitting down and reading a book, um, but finding other ways to just continue to learn about things that are maybe in no way, shape or form tied to your discipline has been hugely impactful in my life. Uh, so I'm a big believer in audible, listening to all kinds of audiobooks. Um, you can see a couple of the ones that I've finished recently here, uh, but like Twitter, right? Scrolling through and following people that you can learn from on Twitter, uh, making that some, a space where you uh, have a feed of people saying things that are you know, intelligent and not just kind of mindfully scrolling. Um, you know, big believer in podcasts, reading differing perspectives across these different publications. And um, it, it's just amazing to me as I kind of reflect on this, how many different places this becomes helpful, right? And, and if you had told me it when I was at Michigan Tech, but like, hey, these will help you in your day-to-day -day conversations, I would have been like a little skeptical. Um, you know, but as a personal example, like, you know, we were visiting one of my wife's family friends in Kentucky and, um, you know, first time meeting them, he was talking, talking about like, you know, what, what do you do? And they were saying like, oh, like I work at the airport and that, no, but not in the like part that you see and like the, the shipping part. And I had just happened a couple of weeks earlier because I was curious about logistics and shipping, watched a YouTube video while I was eating breakfast on the logistics of, inter, or, of air freight. And they spent a meaningful part of that video talking about the Cincinnati airport, the role that that plays in global shipping. And so kicked off what ended up being a 30, 45 minute conversation about their work and how that, how that went. And we formulated a connection uh, in a much deeper way than I would have if I didn't know anything about that. Um, and that's true everywhere I go, being able to talk intelligently to people in the UK about their political structure and how that's changing. Um, these are all things, right, that like nobody teaches you in a class, but that you just start to, to learn by being curious and seeking out that knowledge. Um, so something it's definitely worth finding, you know, time in your day and whatever way that you learn um, to, to incorporate that. One of the other big things I, like I said, alluded to earlier is like, I'm a big believer that everyone gets luck. Um, it just really is a matter of if you're ready to take advantage of it and what you've done to prepare for it. Uh, I do think it's important when you kind of make statements like that, like, you know, to acknowledge, right? Like I'm a white male in America that went to an institution and studied STEM, right? Like I am the definition of privilege. There's so many people out there that have dealt a harder deck. Um, and yeah, I think that that's critical to acknowledge. But I also think that, you know, that, that sentiment, right, of everybody having some luck at some point in their life and having some agency and autonomy to be able to capitalize on it is also true. Um, and so, you know, for me, I got incredibly lucky that Garrett, who came up with this now $3.5 billion idea, happened to go to Michigan Tech around the same time that I did. He transferred in from McKinney College, um, and the luck continued uh, because I got an email in my inbox one day saying, hey, you know, I've heard about some of the work that you're doing, would love to meet with you. And it was Garrett who had heard about the organizational involvement, the projects and the partnerships that we'd done across campus through Mudboard and USG wanting to have a conversation. And so in Mub 106, we sat down, we weren't talking about handshake or startups or anything like that, but it was talking about how can we actually bring our organizations closer together to partner. 
And that's why I think this idea of being ready for it makes such a big difference. That conversation never would have happened and I would not be here talking to you today if I hadn't gotten involved and really started to push myself to, to start to think about how can I go above and beyond for these organizations? How can I go above and beyond to help other people using the connections that I have on campus? Um, Gary would have never found me, right? And so I think this is just you know, one of so many examples where um, you never really know when your luck is gonna come but by going above and beyond, by connecting, by, by getting out there and getting connected, um, you can really set yourself up to capitalize on it. And it ties back to what we were just talking about with learning too, right? Being able to actually have that kind of lifelong learning, that intrinsic curiosity for any of those topics is going to make it so that when that luck does come along, you probably know at least enough to be dangerous, which is probably all you really need to capitalize on it. Um, so I think that that's really, uh, really kind of something that uh, I resonate with. The uh, other thing, uh, and this has been a personal journey for me that I think is really, um, and this is maybe a bit controversial given the Michigan Tech like, you know, audience and the technical kind of focus, but um, I'm a third generation engineer. I grew up um, listening to my dad and my grandpa kind of you know, jokingly, but complain about sales and marketing and how like, you know, they're a necessary evil, but an evil nonetheless. And so I always kind of thought about you know, sales as that like sleazy salesman who's trying to get you to pay way more for a used car than you need to, right? Um, but what I've come to realize is you know, I, I joined Handshake. Um, at the time, we were still in Houghton. I was actually still finishing my last year at Michigan Tech while working full-time for Handshake. I was doing support tickets while I was in the, you know, my biology class. Then I would go back and I'd be like doing demos with the university. And as my role continued to grow, a lot of my emphasis was on how do we bring on new university partners? And it took me about two years to admit that that was sales. I mean, you say it out loud and you're like, I'm like bringing new universities onto the platform. That, that was sales. Um, but it just felt dirty, right? It felt like, you know, that wasn't something that I should be using my technical degree to do this type of thing. Uh, but actually what I've since come to learn is that sales is probably you know, it, sales is engineering. It's just with people instead of, you know, hardware or software, those types of things. You're basically taking problems that people have and you're translating those into solutions using systems and platforms that you have. That is how I think about sales. And when you frame it like that, it's using the same principles that we learn as engineers, right? On how to actually approach this, solve problems, break these types of things down in a systematic way. Uh, but in many ways, it's actually harder because it involves people and people are messy and illogical and don't always fit in nicely into boxes. Um, and so if you think about it that way, it starts to become this really fun challenge that I would encourage you to lean in. One of the most influential books that I read when I was at Michigan Tech was How to Win Friends and Influence People. I had been recommended this book many times. It's a classic, um, but I always thought it kind of sounded a little like uh, snake oily, if I'm being honest, but it is uh, one of the best books that I've ever read in terms of how to actually start to think about creating connections um, how to actually start to manage this. So if this is an area that's scary for you, definitely would recommend this book. It's, uh, it's, a, good, um, it's a good one. The last thing I'll say here too, if there's anybody on here that is also, you know, that's more motivated not by solving problems, but by money, salespeople are usually the highest paid people at these organizations by a significant factor. Um, it pays to bring in revenue for the company. Companies can't be successful without it. And so that is also worth throwing out there and can be confusing. Um, getting to the end here of my tips, we'll get into some startup tips before we open up for questions. One of the things that I cannot recommend enough is to go abroad. I remember again, back on that, when I was kind of TA in that Pavlos class, I, um, a lot of what we were doing, is kind of preparing people and students for their third year when they would go abroad, they would go to, uh, at the time, I think it was India, Ghana, Malta, or there was one other one that they had just opened. Um, and you know, that was a whole set of mixed emotions. Some people were super excited about that. Some people were terrified about it. Some people are ambivalent. Um, and I remember putting this quote on the screen, which still resonates with me today, which is, I'm going to read it out loud, uh, which is like, why, why do you go away? So that you can come back, so that you can see the place that you came from with new eyes and extra colors. And the people there see you differently too. Coming back to where you started is not the same as never leaving. And ooh, still gives me chills today because I remember when I was at Michigan Tech, I thought the QAnon was the absolute best place in the world. Still think it's one of the best places in the world, by the way. But I remember having a conversation with uh, a girl I was actually dating at the time. You know, she had done some traveling and, and uh, you know, 
was kind of had gotten the travel bug, was eager to go see more places. And for some reason, it's still stuck in my head. I remember kind of looking at it and like, I don't really understand that. Like, what could possibly be better than the Keweenaw, right? You have just so many different kind of nature and outdoor things to do. Uh, and it wasn't actually until about a year later when I went to India as a part of the Pavlos program that I saw what travel does to you. It does change you in a way that I did not anticipate. Um, it opens your eyes to ways of working and thinking that are fundamentally different and is very just transformational in the way that you kind of see the world and approach things. Um, and I, I don't know that I realized this at the time, but those experiences that I had actually is what set me up to be successful in launching Handshake internationally. Um, being able to enter a new culture, a new country, live somewhere brand new for three years, figuring out the nuances of the healthcare system and all these different aspects um, were, were possible because I had these experiences and I was open to it. Uh, so I think if you have the opportunity, whether it's a study abroad, whether you just want to go on a vacation, like wh whatever that may be, like go somewhere that challenges you. Um, don't just, you know, if you can, like go somewhere that's not just like a, you know, manicured resort in a bubble, like go, go out there, like put yourself in a situation that's scary and terrifying where things don't go well uh, because you'll grow and, and you'll come back totally different than you left. Entering part two of the the the, uh, the presentation here, which is not as long, uh, but it's so you want to start a company. Uh, you could also frame this as so you want to work for a startup. Um, I thought yeah, I'd just share a couple of the things that I always have top of mind when I'm talking to people about what it's like. Um, some of these are are cautionary, I should say, uh, but I think you know, maybe so. So maybe it's worth saying that like. Joining a startup is the best decision that I've ever made in my entire life. It is uh, changed everything about kind of my life trajectory in terms of professional context, in terms of the friends that, that I've made throughout the, the journey, the opportunities that I've had to, to see the world. Um, you know, from a financial perspective, there's so many reasons to join a startup. Uh, but I think it's important that people go in with eyes wide open because it is not easy. <laughs> I think that it's kind of glamorized. You see all these things in the news and you see success stories like some like Facebook or uh, your Instagram, Twitter. You, you hear these stories and it seems like it's the the kind of easy path to success. Um, and, you know, it, it's not <laughs> easy. is not a word that you should associate with a startup. I had the opportunity to be a judge at the elevator pitch competition yesterday. Um, one of the number one things that I think people don't think about when thinking about starting a company is distribution. Uh, this meme, I think is hilarious. Uh, it's one of those things that is probably funnier for somebody who's worked in a startup than those who aren't. Uh, but essentially we, the reason this is funny is that for people who are starting their first company, all, the, the primary focus is generally product, right? Like, how do I build the best app? How do I build an app to solve this problem? How do I build this thing, which will be, you know, so good that people will just want it? And usually what happens is that, you know, they get a little bit of traction and they run head on into this problem of how do I actually start to scale this? How do I actually get people to use this? How do I scale the distribution um, this becomes even harder if you're talking about markets places. We have multiple sides of a marketplace that you have to have um, spinning basically in unison. And so a lot of times, you know, second time founders are looking for opportunities not to build the best product, but to find the best, most creative distribution channel. And so as you're thinking about, if you're, you're in a position where you think about starting a company, solve distribution first and then figure out how to build your product. Um, it will save you so much pain down the road. Uh, from Handshake's perspective, we have a three-sided business model. So we have universities that use Handshake to power their career services offering for, for institutions. As a part of that, they pre-create accounts for their students and they um, offer Handshake as a they service to connect with the university to employers. Uh, that, that kind of basically model enabled Handshake to grow to 650,000 companies, um, over kind of 20 million students that have accounts on the system, um, and 1,400 university partners without having any meaningful user acquisition costs, right? It's one of the reasons that Handshake's valued at three and a half billion today is because we've cracked into this kind of multi-sided distribution model that is really unique, it's defensible, and it adds value on all three sides. Everybody wins from that. So solve distribution, things will come easier for you. Maybe this one's obvious, but I'm gonna say it anyway, be prepared to work like really, really hard, especially if you're joining an early stage company. 
Um, it is messy. It is hard. Uh, I remember one of the conversations that we had when we were sitting, uh, we, there was, I think, 10 of us at the time, sitting in the Palo Alto house, kind of thinking about how are we going to pull this thing off? And we did the math. We said, okay, you know, our, our number one competitor has been around for about 15 years. They've got about 200 employees, which means that every single one of us has to do 10x to 20x the impact of av the average one of their employees. And so if you start to think, about it like that, you understand why working at a startup is not an easy thing. Uh, you really have to focus on what matters. You have to like out compete, out execute, uh, and kind of be more nimble, creative uh, than your competition if you're going to make it successful. So that requires a lot of sacrifices, um, particularly like I said in the early stages of getting the thing off the ground. Uh, it is uh, is tough. I I like this laugh, this like kind of meme on the the bottom. It, uh, it, it rings true for, for me. And I know a lot of the early team members of Handshake, when we had to make some you know, kind of very real sacrifices just to figure out how we're going to get this company to survive the next couple of weeks or months. Um, from the outside looking in, you don't necessarily see that, uh, but it is very real. Which brings me to the third point, which is that startups are messy. Uh, if you are working in a startup, you will have the highest highs and the lowest lows that you have ever experienced. It will be a roller coaster. And sometimes they come in the same day. Um, maybe kind of two examples here. When I joined, you know, first, first employee at Handshake, I kind of had this mental model where it's like, yeah, I'm going to be, you know, an, an executive, right? Like I'm going to be like the manager, like building all these teams. And like, I had literally just graduated from university. I knew nothing about managing or building teams, recruitment, hiring, HR policies, like, um, the, you know, the best way to structure teams for, for performance. And so, you know, about a, you know, probably six months after we moved to Palo Alto, you know, we brought somebody in. And I was told like, dude, David, you're not going to be managing the university team like this person is. And, and that was, um, that was tough. I'll go into another point that we have earlier and it, it hurt, right? It really was, it was tough. Um, and, you know, you just kind of have to, to kind of accept that, to, to put your ego on the, the side, uh, which actually this next one, but I'm going to come back to that. Um, another example of this, right. is like we, uh, when I was in the UK, we had our one of our big early partners meetings. We had signed up some incredible institutions like Cambridge, University of Liverpool, uh, you know, the, the kind of universities that we got to take a chance on us in the UK early on was just incredible. And they were all coming together in London for this kind of um, kind of you know, vision looking forward partnership. How can we really make this successful? It's going to be a great day. Uh, and so I was feeling so good. I was like, so proud of the accomplishments. And literally as I got off the train, the tube in London, I got an email from one of our key employees saying that they were leaving Handshake effective immediately. And it's just like, boom, right? And you go from high to low. And that happens, you know, like I said, sometimes multiple times a day. Uh, you get through it, you keep moving on, but it is a roller coaster of emotions. I love this article. If you want to learn more about what it's like to the kind of this emotional component, this give away your Legos. I share this with almost everybody that joins Handshake that hasn't worked in a startup before. Uh, and basically this is the idea that when you are a small startup, you have lots of responsibilities, right? So you, like I said, like when I was, I joined Handshake, I was doing all the support. I was doing the product. I was helping on the engineering. I was doing sales, I was doing marketing. Um, I was doing everything right? Along with like everybody else at the company, because that's what we had to do. But as you get bigger, you hire people to do those things, to take on those aspects. But that means that you have to give away your responsibilities. That's the metaphor, give away your Legos. And that can be really, really hard because you feel like you're making yourself irrelevant. But the faster that you actually realize that you're not making yourself irrelevant, you're empowering the organization to move faster and be more successful while also freeing your time up to focus on more strategic priorities, the organization will flourish. Um, so this is, I think, a super helpful article. I'm not going to dwell on it. You can read it, um, but that's the other aspect. Going back to that story I mentioned, like, you know, the, it's so critical to move, leave your ego at the door. Like, it is, you know, I, I cannot emphasize that enough, right? Like, it, if you have a big ego and you're looking for, like, you know, fancy titles and, like, people to make you feel like you're super important above all else, like, you will not be successful at a startup. Uh, I think my title has changed something like 25 times. I, the people I've reported to has changed constantly, right? You're hiring and moving and doing different organizations. And, and that can be super hard for people who really value that kind of stability and who look to something like a title for some sort of indicator of worth. Um, if you are 
okay with ambiguity though, it can be one of the best ways to move up quickly in your career because it, it, you know, it should be anyway, more of a, a meritocracy where your impact dictates the influence and what you're asked to do. You hear a lot about this, we're, we're almost done. Love to open it up for, for questions here if there are any, um, but you hear a lot about the stats of startups failing and they're true, right? It's, it's like something like one in a hundred chance that a startup will be successful. Uh, those odds go down, I think even, even more if you don't have previous experience, right? So it's it can be quite daunting, right? To take this type of risk. Um, it's worth doing anyway. And if for no other reason, then the, the best part about working for a startup is that you'll gain 20 years of experience in five. Um, you know, being, you know, what, seven years out of university and having had the opportunity to launch into a brand new market, live internationally for three years, like have experience in sales, marketing, hiring, managing teams, like that just doesn't happen in a traditional organization, right? And so that type of experience can only happen in a high growth startup. Um, so even if the organization doesn't work, especially if you're early in your career, it can be an incredibly powerful way uh, to accelerate the opportunities that you have long-term. I think, yeah, so this is last, last thing. This is, I think, true in life actually, uh, which is saying no is the most important thing. Focus is everything. Um, especially as you, there's like this, this valley of death almost with startups where uh, at the beginning, you, you're just focused on getting a little bit of traction. As soon as you start to get traction, opportunities start to present themselves. You could build this product, or you can move in this vertical, or you could do this type of customer, or you could start to you go to these different conferences or like you know, all these different things come to you. And if you do try and do all of them, you're destined to do none of them super well, which means you will fail. And so trying to think about and spending as much time focusing on what do we not do as what we do do is absolutely critical. And I think, you know, like I said, I think that's actually something that you can bring just to daily life, right? Is that I think so, so much of like the busyness in our culture is just because people have a hard time prioritizing what's important to them and saying no. And so just like your startup's life depends on being able to do that, and your personal happiness is a big part of that as well. My philosophy, anyway, I'm getting into philosophical aspects here. So anyway, I have talked for like 42 minutes straight or something like that. So I would love to take a break and see if there are any questions. I'm happy to have kind of a, a free flowing conversation. If there are questions that people want to put in the chat or they want to drop on mute and ask, I don't know if there's, a, uh, yeah, if there's, any questions at all? Hi, David. Hey, Jesse. I'm going to ask the first question. Um, so you mentioned uh, challenges that you faced along the way, um, and I I got to witness a few of them. But um, <laughs> what would you say to students who are facing those first challenges and those first failures about what to do next? Um, super good question. I think uh, I think a couple points that I would highlight. One is that. Um, you know, everybody fails and it's far better to fail now than it is when the stakes are much higher, right? And so, uh, and when I talk about the stakes being higher, like you know, failing as a student at, you know, in an organization or with a class or like a project, right? Like long-term consequences are, are nearly the same as messing up the first project that you've been entrusted with in your actual professional career, right? Where that reputation that you get will largely dictate the future opportunities that you have. So if you accept the fact that everyone's going to fail at some point, far better to get it out of the way and to learn from that at university than it is when the consequences can be much higher. Uh, I think the second thing is like, it doesn't define who you are, right? I think the reason people oftentimes are afraid of failure is that they don't, they think that then, you know, if they failed once, then they're destined to continue to fail. And I think the sooner you can realize that actually failure is a prerequisite for really growing quickly then it can actually bring a little bit of confidence there and kind of flip the script a little bit, right? Because then you start to look at people who have never failed and said, well, you probably haven't taken enough risks, right? That's why I'm still pushing for the barge. <laughs> That's a bit of an inside joke. I still mention. I, uh, I, uh, I always thought it'd be fun if during one of the, uh, the fall days, we got a big barge and we just put a band out there, just 
you know, let's brush out the, the problems with putting high voltage wires through the, the portage canal, what could go wrong, right? So <laughs> any other questions? David, I have a question. So one of the things that you talked about in your presentation is that Handshake is designed to democratize access to opportunity. And that really, um, that was, that, that really captured, I think, what you're doing and, and the value proposition really well. But I'd like to know if you could tell us a little bit more about some of the problems that exist that you're, that Handshake is addressing. Um, yeah, like this. absolutely. Yeah, the uh, and I think you are. Know, I'll tell you maybe two parts. I'll say how we kind of experienced this at Michigan Tech, and then I think what we've learned is that you know, we we had it so much better than we we ever could have imagined compared to what a lot of students face. Um, so you know, my personal dream was I wanted to work at Apple. Um, I studied computer engineering and computer science at Michigan Tech because that's what my I thought that doing both of them together would make me a more appealing candidate. Um, I got to campus and realized that like Apple had never set foot on campus. I couldn't find a record of any alumni who had went and worked there and they had not posted a single job in our university system. Um, we actually used to drive down some of the kind of people into hackathons and stuff. Like we would drive down the University of Illinois and crash their career fair so that we could talk to some of these tech companies. We walk up to the tech companies like, oh, like we went to MTU and they're like, oh, is that uh, like MIT? We're like, nope. Like, and the reality is that they just hadn't heard of it. And you can't fault them for that because there's 2000 universities in the United States. And the requirement for a company to hire from them was that they had to know every single university. They had to go to their career center website. They had to create a separate username, separate password, separate profile, separate job posting, just to post a job that students could find. And that friction created huge amounts of inequality. It basically meant that if you didn't happen to go to one of these target universities for one of these companies, you couldn't figure out how to get to those companies. At the at the same time, we we think that that influences you know, the the trajectories of a lot of students, right? Like if you can't see something, it's really hard to know it exists. And so, um, if students aren't seeing it, it's hard to go search for it. Like it, it just there's all these problems within the the recruitment space. Now, when you actually start to look at you know, Michigan Tech, like Michigan Tech has one of the largest career fairs in the country, right? Like when we actually start to look at the data and we have all the data now, we have almost every university in the US on handshakes, we can see the, the volume of that. Dude, we had access to a huge amount of opportunities. But if you start to look at some of these historical black, or historically black colleges and universities who have literally no endowments, they have one person trying to do career services for their entire teams, companies aren't coming there they need a way to plug in and to get their talent in front of these companies. And so that's what we've done with Handshake. We've built this network that allows companies to recruit for free across every single university on the Handshake system. Students build out profiles such that it, you know, they're not relying on just like going in and seeing the right job at the right time. Companies can actually come to them and ask them to apply, can buy, you know, have conversations and come in. Um, maybe it's a career fair, maybe it's an event, like actually facilitate that type of engagement. And so by, by building this ecosystem has leveled the playing field so that it's just as easy for an employer to connect with a student at Michigan Tech as it is for them to go to Boston and connect that way. Uh, and so it's been just really incredible to see this. It's super fun. I was doing a demo yesterday. I still use my Michigan Tech alumni account sometimes. Um, and now I log in and it's like, I can join a Google info session. I can see Apple jobs. Like it has fundamentally changed the way that students, employers and universities connect. Uh, and we're just getting started. We, we think we've kind of started to crack the surface of leveling the opportunity, like access to jobs, but that's only part of the problem, right? At the end of the day, you know, access is one piece, but access to information and social capital probably do more to dictate long-term career success than anything else. And so that's what you see us starting to invest in now. How do we bring relationships to the forefront to the handshake ecosystem so that it doesn't matter where you go to school or who you know, you can facilitate connections that will help you get that job. Hi, Jim. Hey, David. Welcome back. Speaking to of helping us here. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, you know, as you journeyed from six guys crammed in a little house in Houghton to, to where you are now and, and two employees to 500 employees, what do you miss about being small? And, and like what, uh, you know, things go away when you're, when you're really small and, and uh, different problems as you grow, right? Obviously, everybody wants to be successful, but Talk about what, what parts you really kind of miss and, and what parts are, are easier because of the size. Maybe easier is the wrong word, but. Yeah, 
Super good question. So the there's a lot, right? I think um, it, the the kind of connection I think that you have like as a, a small team, right? It's it's like it it it's you know. I don't know, never, never been in actual battle, right? But it kind of feels like that camaraderie that you get, right? When you are, you are going to battle with a group of people, you know, it used to be like, we'd wake up at 5 a.m. because we had to start supporting customers on the East Coast. And then we'd basically be working until 11.30 p.m., right? Like we were just constantly there. And like, you come the weekends, like we're all still together. You just have that kind of connection and camaraderie that is just not there. Even when you start to get to 50 people, like you lose that type of, um, connection where everybody knows everyone. Uh, I used to tell people, it's like going to be very weird for me when I come into the office and I don't know everyone. You know, we're over 500 people now. We'll be almost a thousand by the end of this year. Like I don't know 90% of the company, which is um, like sad, right? I miss that era where everyone knew everybody and you could, you could kind of iterate. Um, there's that kind of intermediate area. I think that's like pretty neat too, where it's like, you're still small enough that like people know each other, you can move quickly. There's not a lot of that kind of bureaucracy or process. Um, that's like kind of 50 to 250 people. And that that's also a very special time. So it's, it's, uh, it's very, it's hard to articulate as you can tell, cause I'm struggling to, but there's this kind of, as you get bigger, it's neat because you start to see new problems, right? Like you're starting to think about everything from like, you know, you know, we have enough resources now. Do we think about different like acquisition modes? Like, do we actually start to think about, you know, um, other countries that we're expanding to, like what are the different product verticals? Like how do we think about going public, right? And like, what's the financial planning? And so you start to feel this almost like structure that for somebody who's been there since the beginning when there was a zero structure feels almost like a little constraining, but you know that that's actually part of the growth, right? That's part of the process. That's part of what needs to happen and how like a real companies run. Um, so it, it's definitely this kind of phased approach, but I think what I miss the most, right? Is that that kind of like, camaraderie you know we live live and breathe this organization like you know and and um you know we're all kind of going down with the ship if it if it goes under that that you kind of lose that as you scale <laughs> any other questions sure I'll, I'll i'll take one here my name is john Strosi. i work on campus and uh um, do you plan on have visiting campus uh, anytime in the near future? I hope so. I was actually kind of hoping to come up for for this weekend, but or this week. But we had a number of things we had to kind of take out down here, um, and have a couple couple kind of trips coming up in the next uh, couple couple weeks um, for some work stuff. But definitely would love to get back to campus. Summer in the Keweenaw is one of my favorite things in the world. So now that I'm back in the U.S., uh, it's a little bit more a little bit more accessible. It's not. It's probably easier to get to London than than Keweenaw, the Keweenaw in some cases, but uh, but I'm excited to get back up there for sure. Great, thanks, David. Um, I have a question for you. So, Handshake was just recently valued at 3.5 billion, and that is a crazy number. <laughs> yeah. So can you tell us about investors, what invest, how investors think about investing in startups and why they're excited about Handshake? Yeah, I think the, um, the whole, the kind of VC landscape, I think is, is super interesting in the way that they think about kind of companies. I think the number one thing that they're looking for is growth potential and what the overall kind of potential of the, the market is. Um, you know, handshake, I think, has been really interesting for VCs to kind of wrestle with, right? When we first started fundraising, um, it was actually, you know, Garrett tells the story that it, it was a, a powerful reminder of how the problem that we're trying to solve in university recruitment exists in lots of other spaces. Garrett, you know, was, uh, he was he'll tell the story, his dad was a construction worker, like went to community college for two years before coming up to Michigan Tech, and then you know, found himself out in Silicon Valley trying to fundraise. And the number one way that you can raise money is through the networks and relationships you have. He had none. So he spent four months just like sleeping on friends' couches, trying to break into this ecosystem. And once you got those meetings, it was like, you're going to build software for universities. Like, do universities have any money? And like, there was this kind of like narrow focus of like, how, how could this actually be something bigger? Um, but very early on, we, we saw that this is an opportunity to really change this landscape and redefine what early career recruitment meant. 
And if you could do that, and you could do that with all three sides of these ecosystems working together, universities, employers, and students, um, you could build something that in and of itself was a big business. When you think about things like you know, the, the most recent valuation, like what what were what our kind of thesis is, right? Is like the the um, landscape of higher of education is changing, right? There's new models that are bringing new people into the world of education, whether that's you know, the the kind of certificate programs like Coursera, or Udacity, or Grow with Google, uh, whether that's um, you know kind of universities kind of unbundling some of their offerings, going online, these massive universities that you see that are doing this, um, and so if we can actually start to to serve those verticals and make it so that if a student's first professional network is Handshake, that when they come to look for that second job, they're coming back to Handshake, we could actually disrupt LinkedIn from the bottom up, right? So one of the, the kind of, you know, I think it was Forbes that basically said that Handshake's latest fundraise put LinkedIn in our sites. And we fundamentally believe that LinkedIn is so focused on who you know and what your past has been that is alienating for somebody who's trying to reinvent themselves, look at what the future is to, to define a new course or to launch their career from university. And so while LinkedIn is all about your past, Handshake wants to be the professional network of your future. And if you start to look at you know, LinkedIn valuation, they were bought what, many years ago now by Microsoft for 12 and a half billion. They're probably worth closer to like 50 or 60 based on today's valuations. You can start to see how that, um, you know, not, it's not too hard to start to squint and see how Handshake could really become a household name here in the, the next couple of years. And I just posted an article in chat uh, for folks to take a look at if they wanted to know a little bit more about some of the, the points that you're touching on with regard to the valuation and the value proposition. Hi, David. Um, I had a question. You talked about um, when doing the startup, you're, you can expect to deal with extreme highs and extreme lows, you know, even in one day. I was curious how you personally dealt with those um, ex experiences and how you would suggest uh, people to, to deal with those experiences. I love that question. And I have gotten better at this. So uh, if I'm being honest, kind of going back to, to like early days, uh, the way that we blew off steam was not what I like, not healthy, not what I recommend. Um, uh, basically, it was like, you know, come come Friday evening, like we were, you know, partying and drinking. And like, that was how we blew off steam. If you look at pictures from me during the time that we were in the Palo Alto house, like, I don't have a neck, like it, it was not a healthy time of my life. Um, and I remember actually, let's see, would have been two years after that, we were, uh, Garrett and I were in, um, uh, in the UK for a conference. And I you know, kind of asked him this, right? Cause he's, I, I have so much respect for him. Like more than anyone I've ever met, he's been, had to reinvent himself every three months. Like it is, you know, unbelievable how much change and, and what he's been able to, to kind of accomplish. And so I asked him, I was like, Hey, like, how, how do you do this? Right? Like, how do you, how do you manage the stress that you're under? Right. I mean, like you th hear these big numbers, like three and a half billion. It's like, that's cool. But at the end of the day, somebody just put 200 million into handshake saying, you better not mess this up. And the amount of pressure that that puts on you is unimaginable. So I'm like, how do you, how do you manage this? Right? Like, and the, the thing you like, you look at me, he's like, honestly, exercise, exercise and a healthy diet. And I was like, it cannot like, that's like, so are you a doctor now? Like this is so cliche. And I'll tell you what, I started, I started like running more and it was miserable. I hated it. Still not my favorite, but it helped manage that stress in a way that was very surprising to me. And so now you kind of get to a point where you start to get trained where it's like, you're having a, you, you just walk out of a super shitty meeting or like you get a terrible email. That's like, I'm going to go for a run. Right. Because like you just puts it in perspective. I don't know why biologically don't understand. Probably somebody at Michigan Tech could explain it to me, but like, that's the number one thing I'd recommend, like eating healthy, exercising, and um, it just helps put those things into perspective. Thank you. That's great advice. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, I do have one, one more question. So what resources would you recommend to somebody who's interested in learning more about technology startups? Um, so uh, the first round, I, uh, which is the organization that wrote that uh, Give Away Your Legos, first round capital, they 
as the name suggests, uh, specialize in investing in a startup's first round. And they have a lot of really good content on just startups and how to think about them. Um, if you're into podcasts, some of the podcasts I've gotten into really um, recently is How I Built This, which is an NPR podcast. That's not specific to tech companies, but I, I love the way that they just bring to life what goes into making some of these companies that, that you know, some of them you've heard of, some of you've never heard of, uh, but they interview kind of the founders. And, and I think they just really more eloquently than I do talk about kind of the highs and lows and what goes into it and how, how they made these things happen. Um, so that's a, a really good resource, I think. Um, there's another book. Uh, there's lots of books. One of the um, kind of interesting, like the very classical one is Zero to One by Peter Thiel. A bit controversial in, in Silicon Valley, but still, I think, good points, right? Which basically, like, you're not looking to compete. You want to find an organization or, or a vertical where you are the only option, right? Um, so that's a good book. Uh, and then the hard thing about hard things, if you want empathy for um, some of these CEOs, right? Like, you know, there's there's kind of a cliche, right? Which is like, no one feels sorry for a billionaire, which like, fair. But also, you start to, like, read through this, right? And what actually goes into holding the, the lives of potentially thousands of people in your hand having pressure from investors like uh it was very humanizing at least for me to, to start to read that um so there's there's a lot of resources like that out there as well wonderful thank you so do we have any other questions All right. Well, this has been a great talk. Thank you, David. Thank you for sharing your journey and your insights and your personal your personal growth throughout this experience. It's very it's great. We appreciate it, and we wish you the best of the best of everything. So, of course, yeah. Thank, thank you all for for having me. So good to see some some familiar faces on the call, and hopefully, I'll be back to campus soon to to maybe do this again in person or something. So, thanks, that everyone. Be, that would be fantastic. Take care. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.